there. Heather Boyd has kindly joined us. Heather is a member of our um, Northern Ireland network and she has um, been with the network for some time, but she also works with Groundwork here as a community gardener. I'm just trying to work out how I can um, move this on to the next, next page with Zoom because it's not working, bear with me. Oh, there we go. So Heather, would you like to just give a little bit of an intro and let people hear from you because I've been talking for a while now. Over to you. Okay, thanks, Gronya. Um, hi everybody, good morning. Um, and I've been seeing everyone coming in and chat and there's lots of people with the same sort of passion I have for growing food, growing community there. So I'm spying that, that's lovely. Um, just to let you know, Gronya and I have been talking about this for a while and then we've made it possible. So I suppose the, a little bit about me is my in my work role, I am a community gardener for Groundwork Northern Ireland. We're part of the Groundwork Trusts across the UK. And obviously, as the title says, community gardener, I'm involved with growing food and in community gardens and getting other groups to do it. But that's only part of my life. So we've got the home life as well. And then what we do in our own local communities. So there I've been active in different groups. And I stay very active in the network that Gronje runs because I find it really personally rewarding and motivating. Um, and sometimes, you know, although there can be similarities in what I do in my home life and also what I do in my work life, I just find being with everyone else and connecting with the other communities inspiring. And it gives me ideas to be, keep fresh, keep motivated and, and keep moving forward, especially in the recent year, what we've all gone through. Absolutely. And Heather, we talked a little bit about, you know, what we, what we would include and what we should include. But I thought it might be quite good to give people a chance now with the chat to just drop in, you know, what they're hoping to get from today's session. We obviously have a bit of a session plan that keeps it simple, but it would be really good to know from you all, you know, what you're coming today with a hope to, um, to talk about. Um, and what we will do then is try and use some of those topics and themes to create our breakout sessions around them so that you're able to be involved in a conversation that's perhaps in the space you're hoping for. So please do ch drop into the chat, you know, what you hope to get from today's session. And I'll just read a few of those out if that's okay. So we'll hope to see you now. Can I, can I add to that, Gronia? You and I, when we were talking about this, we were saying this, it's so big that this is really just the start of the journey. And whenever we are seeing what people want, well then we can actually tailor sessions in the future so people really want to talk purely about food growing, then can we look at a session for food growing? Or if people want to talk about wildlife planting, then we can do things along that line. Um, I suppose this is the start of the conversation when we see what people want and what they need and how they want to connect and what they want to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that's quite hard when you're planning a session like this is to know the level that everybody's going to come to the table at. So, you know, there, I can see already from the chat that some of you will be, you know, extremely um, well versed in this area. And you may look and think this is, you know, this is too basic. But bear in mind that this is designed that anybody who sees it on social media can pick it up and be engaged and think to do something where they live. Um, and we hope that you'll be able to bring your knowledge and experience and benefit people within the um, the breakout rooms as well today. So you're very welcome. Um, just looking through here um, to see if we can get a few of the ideas. So I can see here um, there's someone from Corporation Park Supporters Group in Blackburn. You're very welcome. Um, you're in the process of setting up a community garden, looking at tying that in with all our community projects. And um, you've also an iconic Victorian garden glass house which is used as a botanic garden for over a hundred years. You're looking to restore that um, and looking for potential operational partners. That's a long message, but you're very welcome to put it in. What I would say to you to do is to very much touch base with Belfast Botanic Gardens who have just done that. Um, so there are people that we could put you in touch with that were involved in that. Um, Catherine says, hello from South Derbyshire. We're about to start a community and forest garden on our co-op, um, 10 acre community woodland land permaculture project and like to know about the early days um, on a project like this. Again, Catherine, we have people within our network in Garva that we could put you in touch with because that possibly won't be covered today unless it's in the chat. Um, ideas, ways to use allotments in Darlington to have fun and growing food, learning and building community. Well, that will certainly touch into some of the ideas that are discussed. Um, and good morning, Colette. Hello again, Colette from the Cabbage Patchers in Warren Point. 
um, here from the community garden and social hub point of view. And then someone doing a horticulture degree would love to learn about starting a career in community gardening. Okay, so you can see there's a lot of real range there of things that people are thinking that they might be able to discuss today. Um, and what we'll probably do is try and divide the, the, the chat up a little bit to enable you to have those chats with people that might be of um, mutual benefit. And we have Kerry from Open Ormo, um, who's a grassroots community collective set up over lockdown with some plans in the future for community gardens and orchard tree planting to bring the community together and improve local and environment. You're very welcome, Kerry. Kerry. And, um, and yeah, and some people here looking for some ideas for care home residents and staff to grow in window boxes, gardens and conservatories. We certainly have some of the ideas up our sleeves for that. Um, so, okay, there's quite a few messages there, Sean. I'm gonna ask you to perhaps look for um, themed topics that might work for breakouts and, um, and we'll carry on with today's session. So back to um, you, Heather. Um, what we were designing this session, folks, we realized that, you know, there's a lot of nervousness around doing any connection in our communities at the moment. And in most parts, if not all parts of the UK, community gardens are in lockdown at the moment. Um, so what can we do to stay connected? And, and what can we do to maintain the connections that existed in community? Um, so we thought the first thing to do so that we don't set anybody's pulses racing with things that they think are not appropriate is that we would discuss some of the, um, the safety measures that are maybe needed um, to be considered. Um, Heather, I know, you know it's not an expert area for you, but you are someone who has had to think about safety on an ongoing basis. I actually found this web link, um, which I think is really good, um, and it's an example from Scottish government around social distancing guidance for horticulture and fruit and vegetable sectors. But actually when I read it, I thought it was very good advice for anybody. So I've just dropped that link in there because I thought folks might benefit from it. And something to say everybody is, you registered for this um, event, so you will get the, the document and the chat saved and sent to you afterwards, along with any of the links and things that people share. And so that will save you if you're scribbling away. Um, so Heather, back to you. Um, safety in the real world when you're running a project like you are, you've had a lot of experience of things to do to make it as safe as possible. Can we just touch on those? I know it's not rocket science for a lot of us, but there might be things that people have overlooked. What do you think? Yeah, well, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that we have all got four different sets of COVID restrictions we're working through across the UK for people just in the UK. So no matter what we say here, your first consideration is what are the legal restrictions in your own area? And you have to take that in. And I also think it's probably not about thinking what we can get away with, because quite often when I've been speaking to groups, it's literally, oh, how far can you push it? And that's really not what it's about. You've got to think firstly about not only your own safety, but the safety of everybody you're working with. So an example is that we looked at, we have uh, our community gardens, they were open, they were closed. If the message was stay at home, literally, it wasn't essential. But what we find is we needed to allocate uh, roles for a couple of volunteers to allow them um, access to gardens to go in to maintain them. You know, keep things watered that needed to be watered. And again, I'm talking through last year, the stage we went through. As re the restrictions here started to relax, people were allowed to come together. And the gardens for a lot of people were a, are a source of positive mental health and they needed them. So we looked at ways that we could make that happen. So the obvious one was you supply your hand sanitizer, you supply, we went for disposable gloves rather than gardening gloves. A good thing, a good point that we had, and again, you have to consider your own circumstances was, well, if you put on a pair of disposable gloves, you take them home and you dispose of them. Don't be leaving them for someone else to have to do that. Um, the community gardens, one of the best part of going to the community garden is the cup of tea time. But th that, again, puts somebody at risk. Um, and normally, for anyone who already has a community garden will know, people make themselves a cup of tea, they walk about, they set it down, and they forget about it. Then they go and make another cup of tea. You get to the end of the session, you'll have cups sitting everywhere. So we, we couldn't have that because it wasn't fair to ask someone then to run that risk. Again, don't forget, we were talking from the early stages of COVID that nobody really fully understood all the transmission risks and how much at risk they would be. Um, so we were saying, okay, if you want a cup of tea, bring yourself, bring it along yourselves in your own cup and you take it home. 
Um, we also put in a, a one touch rule. So a set of tools were set out and people took their own individual tools to use. And then at the end of the session, they were taken, they were sprayed with a disinfectant and set aside for quite a number of days. So the next group coming in, then we're getting a, a fresh set of tools that probably hadn't been touched in a week. Um, even for the people opening the gardens, we had to look at if they were coming along and touching surfaces that anyone could have touched going past. So we were saying, have gloves on before you get to the garden to get it unlocked, get in, and then go around and clean those high touch surfaces the taps, the hose heads, things that probably you can't make individual. Um, the obvious one was uh, uh, relying on trust that people did were asked that if you had any symptoms of it, not to come along so you don't spread it. We also looked then at keeping the details for track and trace uh, with a view to if anyone did within a time of being in the garden, did go down with COVID or show any symptoms, we could then pass it on to everyone else. So we'd up the sort of chasing after people, keeping records. We, I think what was just really important- Just on that, sorry, you had said to you to, to, and folks, I will be just interjecting from time to time because we have an agreement on that. I'm not being rude. <laughs> and, but one of the things um, you just picked up on there was the track and trace. And I've had advice from other community gardens to say that, you know, when things are okay and you're able to be open again, it has been a really good idea to put one of the volunteers in charge of the track and trace to make sure it's properly completed and um, because it's going to help everybody so you know having somebody just keeping an eye that all the details are getting put down as people come in is really valuable um, and then you'd also mentioned about um, you know the the gloves and um, hygiene equipment and the bacterial sprays and again there are some funding pots available across the UK to support that if you're not aware of it get back in touch via the chat and we respond to it after the session but there is there is equipment funding and there is um safety tech in um, funding available to enable you as a group to continue post this stage of lockdown if that makes sense wherever you are so carry, carry on there heather um yeah I think we, we also covered it on, in terms of the community garden but did you want to say a little bit about if you were doing something as an individual as well. Yeah, just on the last bit there about the community gardens, what we also did, we introduced a booking system. So normally we just, we open the, the gates and everyone is welcome and you've got your regulars, but you'll also have people in walking in off the street, but we couldn't allow that to happen because we had to keep the numbers down. What we did find was at certain activities, people, you'd swear they just swallowed magnets because you see them drifting together. So you have to be aware that when it comes to actually activities is trying to ensure that social distancing is met uh, for their safety. And I had personally, I'd seen this because I delivered a session and it kept everybody apart. And when I looked at the, or I thought I had, when I looked at the photographic evidence I took at the end of the session, yep, I've got, how did they get so close? So I think that's something that you really need to be aware of because we're naturally social animals. So that's what we do. Um, and I think that to me given did help to give me an understanding of what the government was pushing and why they've been pushing the distance rules so much because people do automatically come closer together. What did, you were asking me then about home stuff, Gronya, what I've done? Yeah, just yesterday when we were chatting, we were saying about, you know, this, you know, because you've done, you mentioned at the start that you did quite a lot around sharing plants and seeds, yeah. you know, on your street and, you know, at, at your own home. And we mentioned kind of the ways to do that safely. So obviously, um, you know, there's a there's a period of time that you might want us to leave, but you talked about using gloves and just, you know, for people to be thinking about the way in which they do that. Yeah, whenever we were doing activities closer to home, myself and uh, my fellow neighbour who likes to push people on the street to get involved, if we were going out, you obviously for some people we could do it via social media, but if we were giving out paper, you know, like notes to tell people what was happening, we printed them off a few days in advance and we left them aside. We then put on a pair of gloves whenever we went door to door and then we come back in, we washed our hands. So you weren't having any contact and anything that you were handing on to people had been left for a, a suitable period of time. And I think it's really, sometimes whenever you, you look at it, you think it's a bit over the top, but you know, you know personally, if I had, then shown symptoms and I thought I'd passed anything on to anybody. I don't think I could have coped. Um, and likewise coming back. So it was just literally 
still always thinking of your own safety, but other people's safety as well. Um, and yeah, Gronia said, so I, I gave out plants. Um, the nurseries, the garden centres here kept on closing. They were open, they were closed. Uh, so uh, I was joking and saying a lot of uh, plants that I would grow, they would sort of self-seed and they're literally like weeds, but there was never a better time to dig those up, transplant them into little pots. And I put them down at the front of the house. Um, I just took a crate down, turned the crate upside down and set them there, put a bit of paper up, please help yourself. And then I used uh, social media networks to let people know who they were there. Um, we had, uh, has anyone used the next door network? Have you, are you aware of it? Um, it's a fantastic one if people aren't familiar with it. Um, so basically it's not as probably as interactive as Facebook would be in your personal details, but you get connected by the area that you live in. So it was ideal for me to put on there as right, I've got like 100 tomato plants sitting at the bottom of my drive, help yourselves. Um, and people were just driving down. So again, that was local people. So I wasn't, I wasn't encouraging people to come outside further than they should have been traveling. So it was people literally from maybe about a one mile radius around me came and collected them. But yeah, it was, you put them out and sort of on the one touch. If I had to lift the crates back in again, um, it was gloves or else my hands were on, uh, like I'd sanitize them first and then back in and wash my hands. I'm very aware that any time I made anything available to anyone else was to make sure I really wash my hands well afterwards because people touch things and you don't even realize it. Um, and through this, I've started to realize how much I put my hands up to my face. <laughs> so I started to wear a mask quite often in the daytime when I'm in a uh, workspace. Gronia, you're muted. Sorry, um, Lucy has mentioned isn't hands wiser than gloves and in many cases that has been the advice because what has happened is people have reused gloves and, you know, um, or put, as you say, their hands up to their face wearing the gloves. But um, in this scenario where you're doing something that's being handed on um, and where you're potentially gardening and working on an ongoing basis, the gloves are useful in that you can take them off to do something and then, you know, put on yeah. a new pair or whatever. So what we're talking about here in terms of what is possible is we're looking at everybody what is possible to all of us because you know community starts with us um i remember years ago when i joined um eden project which is actually just 10 years ago you know it's flown by um but i remember meeting tim smith and you know he introduced myself and said what my job would be and he said and i said about how nervous i was because my background was in communication and actually this is about um community development and supporting people to uh, make connections where they live and the big lunch has always been about that. Um, and I remember Tim saying to me, well, you know, community doesn't exist without you. And, you know, he wrote it down and he wrote C-O-M-M -M, and then a really big U, N-I-T-Y. And he said, there is no community without you. It's at the heart of community. And I'll never forget that, you know, because it has reminded me all through my job that, you know, it doesn't really matter how much experience you have or how little. We can all play a part. Everyone has a role to play in community. And it might be that you're the person that finds the funding for some big project, or it might be you're the person who makes sure and says hello to everybody that you pass or, you know, reaches out and offers to support somebody when they need it. Um, so yeah, th this is really about growing community from the point of view, not just what you can do for someone else, but how you can e enable other people to see how they can play their part in community too. And Heather, you know, just to touch briefly on it, during the pandemic last year, you've been very modest, but you actually enabled a huge amount of activity um, with, the with the COVID response groups here. Do you want to say a little bit about that just briefly so that people can see? Mm -hmm. It's not just about what you know how to do in terms of your day-to-day -day job. It's also about reaching out and sharing skills when they're, when they're practically useful. Yeah. Right, thanks, Gronia. So, yeah, um, I'm getting a wee bit flustered there from blushing. <laughs> so, when, whenever the sort of pandemic hits, I'm going to say I, with health issues, I sort of nearly, I fall in that sort of shielding bracket. Now, I couldn't have followed the government's advice to the letter, which would literally have put me in one room in my house. Um, I'm not seeing anyone else that I couldn't have done. So everything I did had to be done with caution. Um, but in the early stages, over here in Northern Ireland, it probably was quite different to the mainland. There was a huge shortage of PPE. 
And I'm encouraging people to go out and put on these disposable gloves. And I'm seeing on different social media channels, healthcare professionals crying out for um, PPE. Um, and I was really moved by a local doctor who was on, and I know we've moved away from gardening talk here, so bear with me, folks. Um, there was a comment on from a local doctor in one of the groups. Um, I thought, what what is happening? Why why isn't something happening? Um, they were going, they didn't have PPE, basic things. It wasn't just gloves, it's like masks uh, as well. And I thought, well, okay, my skills as a community gardener aren't, I would say, probably gardening. Maybe I shouldn't admit this on a live broadcast, but maybe the, the plant knowledge is possibly only less of the skills that I would use as a community gardener in my role. It's more about connecting with community and the organisational skills to make things happen. Um, and I thought, what can I do? You know, I'm stuck in the house at the time whenever my natural instinct is let's get out everybody, get, let's get on with it and let's save the world. Uh, but I was stuck inside. So I thought I, re I reached out, sent a private message and said, would fabric masks be of any benefit? You know, so I know everyone was talking about the doctors had been measured up to have the correct fitting masks and all technical above my, my head. But I reached out and I said, look, if we could get people mobilized to make something, would that do as being better than nothing? And the doctor came back and it was like, I was moved to tears by the end of the conversation. So from that, I thought, okay, how do we make this happen? And again, this is the community, the growing community is what can the community do? So we, um, I thought, phoned up, spoke to Gronya's colleague, Neve, and said, Neve, I'm thinking about doing, setting up a group to encourage people to try and make some PPE. Can we use the network to get that out? Um, in my personal life, I don't use, do a lot on social media. It's really too boring for people, okay? Uh, <laughs> I'm not an Instagram type person. But using the, the network for uh, the IN project and using the groundwork, the local network then, I put out a post, created a new Facebook group and, and like a response group and said, who can sew? Can anybody help and start making masks? I'm a doctor here is crying out for it. And the, the group went crazy. This was before a lot of other groups then started to join in as well and making stuff. And literally, yep, somebody went, my mum can sew. And it, People in the group shared it. They shared the knowledge that we set up a Facebook group to try and, and get people motivated, get them mobilised. And within about two weeks, there were hundreds of people on the group um, and people were being proactive. If they couldn't sew, they were had been down talking to their mum, to their granny, to their auntie, to their next door neighbour. And people were sewing, using whatever materials they could get their hands on. And at this stage, I had to admit that my organisational skills were better than my sewing skills. You know, I was thinking, how many masks could I sew in a day? And my, my production mind was kicking in. It's like, how long would it make me to, take me to make one of these? And how many could I make? And by the time I'd made one and it'd take me several hours, I was thinking, this is not a good use of my time. Um, so my role was coordinating. And it literally was all hands to deck for a month in a group and getting people to start making masks. People started to make scrubs. They were making laundry bags. <clears throat> they were making little gadgets to help hold the masks on behind their head. And it's hard to look back now and think we as a community were making uh, some sort of PPE for medical professionals, front facing professionals who had nothing. And yes, and alongside that, there was all the abuse coming from Facebook and people going, this isn't good, this, these are no good. And I was thinking like, well, if you have nothing, surely these are not meant to be one pair, one mask to wear all day. It's like, use them as if they the equivalent of the disposable masks, but wash them. So use 12 in a day. And when health professionals were contacting us, care assistants, you know, asking for a mask, we were saying, you don't want one, you want lots of them so you can keep on washing them. And everybody, it was like, we give them permission to connect with each other. And I think that's the bit that was amazing. So it was like the film was like build it and they will come. And we were just going, just make the masks look, people want them. And then we were saying, well, where are you? And they were then putting on what area they were in. And we were myself and then a couple of friends came on board and we were matching. 
and we have gone, there's somebody down the bottom of the hinge, there's somebody that is looking masks, they can make them, they're only five miles down the road. And talk a little bit more about um, kind of the possibilities. Now we're going to be talking about the possibilities both for individuals and also for groups. But what you need to think about too is that people in your groups who are maybe not, who are very handy and um, very, and they, and they like to be active where they are, may also be able to put their practical skills to use in different ways when they're not able to get into, um, whether that's your uh, group for uh, dinners or whether that's a group for growing or whatever it might be. So um, let me just move us on a little bit further to the next slide, bear with me because now it's not working. Well, if I could just say there, most of us are having to do things online I have to do everything online now. I, I live in a very remote area in the Beckham Beacons National Park, and there really is nothing I can do physically. I'm not a farmer. So everything is online. And a lot we can do online too. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah if you want to move on Heather because obviously some of the people can be online but not everybody is able to do that so if we want to just run through a little bit here around um in the socially distanced activity and some of the things that you pointed out were important for groups to consider if they are going to be taking things to the next stage because what we've actually done is yes we've been able to do the best we can online but that's not to say that there are other people that are left disconnected as a result of being um, not part of the digital age, if you like. So um, could we maybe run through, you mentioned next door earlier, and just some of the things that you thought were important to enable groups to take the next steps to be connected. You mentioned earlier that it was a good idea to um, do things with small numbers and maybe create a waiting list. Did you want to say a little bit about that? Because I know there was a huge appetite um, to get back to being out and about, but how did you manage that? Well, in my own local community then, um, I used my growing skills, and that was getting people to do, to try and grow things and passing things on that they could grow at home. Uh, our situation in Northern Ireland was different because quite often we were locked down harder than other areas, as in the places that were closed. So we were encouraging people that could give out um, plants and things to each other to share their seeds with each other and to try and keep it small you know don't be waiting to have a group to come up with a big solution for a whole neighborhood but literally to just do it by the street you know just even a few neighbors coming together and then trying to uh, once a couple of people did it then it would spread so try not to wait for a huge group response but as individuals what we could do because a lot of the community groups, um, some of them were able to uh, start making food and taking food parcels out to people, but a lot of them, their activities stopped. You know, so if the group activities had stopped, what could people as individuals then do in the meantime to continue those community connections? You know, so when the groups come up and are able to meet again, then we can all come with a lot more experience, but literally the power of what one or two people can do, the changes that they can make is incredible. And you can start small growing activities as in growing food activities, growing flower activities, which are benefit to not only individuals, but also to um, pollinators. You can do things for birds, the bees and small things like that and use that to connect with community in that way. We talked, um, a, little, we talked a little bit, Heather, um, yesterday about, you know, what we can do with individuals and groups. And I know we're moving on to that now. Um, yeah. But just based on what Valerie was saying earlier about, um, you know, ways we can get connected, I think it has been very difficult, particularly for community groups with volunteers and kind of, a, you know, making sure that you're being as safe as you can. And that that is one of the things that it has led to is there has been a lot more and it's been a positive thing too in many respects, there has been a lot more individual activity and people stepping forward to help people be connected exactly on their street. And, you know, it's an interesting thing because it can be very difficult to put your hand up where you live and a lot easier to do it um, as part of a group. So for those people who were unable to, um, you know, go to the community garden or go to their community organization, they've been able to be kind and support people with shopping or with getting online, as Valerie has mentioned. Um, and you mentioned a few of the ideas that potentially could enable people to get connected in this middle space. 
So, yeah. um, you know, when we when we're when we're, we're going to be in the middle ground is what I'm saying between getting back to what we would have considered normal. Yeah. And um, do you want to run through some of those ideas? Because just for everybody that's on the call, the left hand side of the screen were things that people could do as individuals or with a small family group, you know, or your bubble. Um, so maybe you yeah. want to take us through some of that. And then the other side of the screen were things that, you know, you were part of with groups. Yeah, yeah. So probably the ones on the left hand side of that were things that I myself I was doing with people just on a personal level. And you can look at it and there's all different ways that we can do according to what our skills are, what our interests are. You know, so mine was my main thing was I'm all about growing so when I had any surplus plants, any surplus produce is giving it away, sharing it with people. Um, the different ways to communicate, I think, became really, really important. Um, social media came into its own, but using the different channels and WhatsApp. But once you start getting the lines of WhatsApp, you start to get people's phone numbers and you have to then start to really think what you're going to do. And if you end up in, with a group, even if you do it within your street, is being careful that there is no abuse of the information, you know, because GDPR will affect everybody. And I think that's one that we had to, to really be careful with it. I suppose having seen from the chat the amount of people are on connected to community gardens there and interested in that, we should look really at that idea down at the bottom of the donating to food banks, veg box schemes, community gardens or allotments. And in my opinion, sometimes there's high too high an expectation on how much food can be produced out of some of those spaces sometimes community gardens can be quite small with just a few beds i'm not knocking that because any space that people can use to come together is fantastic but so quite often is there isn't a huge amount of surplus food in it but what they could be looking at is is there any way that they could increase what they do to provide more food to other people um, I think it's probably a very appropriate time to even bring in what I did uh, instigated from groundwork. So obviously, work from home, off we came, guards were closed, and as a community gardener, what can I do from home? So we, we supplied kits. And when you just put the word kits down there, it makes it look really, really simple. Um, but we supplied kits to people, so we couldn't bring people to the garden, so we took the gardens to the people. And we did that in the way of supplying growing kits. And the kits comprised everything except a pencil, um, because I just couldn't, <laughs> I just couldn't get the soft enough pencil that would work at that stage. Everywhere was closed as we started it. So we supplied containers, we supplied bags of compost, we supplied the gloves, we supplied seeds and instructions. And that was enough for people to start growing a little food at home. And for many, it was their first go at growing something they could eat. But it was more than that. It was a purposeful and meaningful activity. Because we connected into so many groups that actually had to help with the distribution of these, it then meant that those groups were able to check all up on people, the vulnerable people in their community who maybe hadn't had anyone else calling on their door. They weren't needing foodstuffs brought in. You know, they were managing like that, but they were missing out on human contact. Heather, for some of the people, um, because we've seen earlier people asking about the funding and where to go to to get some of that funding to start, you know, yeah. as part of that move towards getting connected again, I know in my own um, community there have been people, set, um, some of the groups have organised um, simple kits, things to do as craft activities, which you had mentioned yourself as well previously, but also um, those kits don't cost a lot. And actually, you know, you might have been able to provide all of those things, but for an organization who's wanting to get people connected where they live and don't have a lot of money or maybe don't have any at all, there were things that we did with um, the big lunch in Northern Ireland last year. So for instance, we had um, a packet of seeds doesn't cost very much. And actually most people don't need the whole packet of seeds if they're trying growing for the first time. So I know you did this as well, Heather, but dividing up the seeds is a really good way to make the money go further, isn't it? And um, potentially you were mentioning yesterday about sunflowers and how you know low cost they are. You can start yeah. them off in a yogurt pot or whatever it might be, or a, a toilet roll holder. So one of the things as well is your kit might simply be the instructions to help enable people to be active and to stay connected with others, compete on their growing project and just know how to do it at a very low cost. Isn't that true? Yeah. you know. It's like anything that you do in gardening, either community gardening or home garden, 
you know, you've got budget level and you've got the luxury level. So depending on what your budget is, you, you work within the, that remit. Um, and I was discussing yesterday with Gronya about the idea of sunflowers. You know, they're so simple to grow. Everyone has such fond memories of sunflowers as well, you know, from their childhood. And I think everybody remembers from their childhood that these were really giants. And as an adult, they don't seem to be just that tall. Um, no, I'm not talking about the 20 feet competition type here. I'm talking about the normal sunflowers that people will grow in the gardens. Um, so you can buy packets of those. You can probably even do them out of bird seed as well. You just won't know what variety you're going to get. Um, so you can give out small quantities of them, just a few seeds. If you want to be really helpful, you could even start them off so that you're giving people plants. So if you have the skills of getting them past the, the seed germination and past the, the initial stage of the slug attack, which we struggle with in Northern Ireland, um, you could give them out of small plants so that maybe children aren't disappointed. Um, and then you can build competition around it. You can build arts and crafts around it, encourage people. Could they make some sort of a sunflower for the garden? And it's all about that growing community, growing connection. So it's not just the growing itself, it's everything else that goes with it. You know, as if you put the sunflower out, then people are going past, have a conversation with them about it. Start speaking to people who are walking past your house, having a chat with them. The, my sunflowers, instead of normally I would grow them in the back of the house for me to appreciate, I did them at the front of the house for other people to appreciate. And I had so many community conversations around that, just being, by being out in front of my house and working out there, uh, then just chatting with people. You're muted, Gronje. I'm terrible with the mute and the unmute. <laughs> Um, so yeah, in terms of um, groups, though, you, you were talking about um, some of the things that groups can, like particularly groups, if they're not able to get together in the garden or a community organisation who maybe has been uh, meeting up for lunchtime get togethers or perhaps has been a youth club that, you know, can't get together because it's very difficult to stay social distanced when you know, you're excited and want to be out and about and playing. Um, some of the things that and the ideas that that have been really being moved out over the last year have been very interesting. For instance, I know people have been sharing some of their skills and um, whether that might be, you know, community drumming skills online or whether that might be tips to try fermentation. Um, it might even be, you know, helping people to have a healthier lifestyle using knowledge that you've learnt. And they all do link back into, you know, the group that you might have been before, but also linking into ways to be connected um, because we don't know um, what people, what's going to float everybody's boat, isn't that true? Um, and, and I think that one of the things I, I thought was quite interesting about yourself, Heather, is in the previous network meetings that we've had, you've always had really useful and knowledgeable ways to make use of vegetables. And that has sometimes been, a, been an issue for um, other network members who are community gardeners when they've had their plants grown, knowing what to do with them. So this has actually been a time to get connected around um, that knowledge to make use of it afterwards. Yeah, it seems everybody in the UK took to gardening last year and growing food with the demand and purchasing everything. Um, and I saw on the, um, active in sort of gardening Facebook groups and other groups here in, in Northern Ireland. And I could see so many people starting to grow and I thought they're they're hit, going to hit the snags, they're going to hit problems. Um, you know, they're all gusto at it. And I was thinking, oh, we're going to have very fat slugs. <laughs> it's going to be even worse. So um, I came up with, we ran some Zoom sessions. And again, I was able to use it, do it through my job and groundwork for time. But I also did some of it in my own personal time to give people out advice as well. Um, so it was get that, um, go online. We're all in Zoom here. Um, so I basically get people onto Zoom talk through more about growing. So we're not, as here, we're discussing more about the growing community aspect of it, but literally really tying it down to how they would grow, uh, because you were talking about absolute beginners and not only how they would grow, how they were going to use it, because some of the things I could get them to grow quickly and easily were not, maybe not things that were normally things that they would eat. I think baby spinach leaves is one of those common ones, really fast to grow, really easy. Oriental leaves, again, really fast to grow, five or six weeks and people could be picking something. You know, we wanted to try and harness their enthusiasm and get them some results in a short time frame. Um, 
and then it's devoted uh, and it's sort of expanded so all the groups i've worked with we're still doing zoom sessions and we've moved on so from them starting with something really simple they have then moved on to work harder to grow veg and then learning uh, and discussing and sharing recipe ideas with each other and it's yeah. been great one of the things as well to say is i noticed um a really nice um act activity as well because as i said before not everybody is able to make use of digital technology whether that might be because their internet connection is really poor where they live or whether that is that there are so many people in the house already using it for work or school or whatever it might be um the thing about it is too is there there are groups and organizations who are also providing the, the physical you know the kit that comes out to your house and it may be that you can still include people because you can provide instructions in a printed way or provide them with some format to be able to take part so um fermentation is a classic example that you know there's guidance there and people can still participate even if they're not online um one of the things as well i was thinking about just while you were talking there heather was um you know the network activities that we run ourselves so with with um, eden project we have our network space and we have our own online our community and the people who are able to be involved there are obviously then taking those ideas back to the community like we are today um but i wondered maybe if this is the time to break out now and have some discussions around the things that are helping us stay connected and that may potentially move us towards more connected to society because it, it, it is absolutely true that in the last year, it has been very difficult for everyone to stay as connected as they might like. And certainly in this most recent period of time when it's been winter, it has been very, very hard for everybody. Um, but that's not to say that there hasn't been some great ideas. I mean, for instance, my own local community organization started a genealogy course and um, I'm actually now tracing my family tree. And not only is that helping me stay connected with a group of people who are also interested, but it's also stopping me from eating rubbish and watching television because my mind is active in the evenings. I go out for a walk and I come home and get stuck in. So um, the problem with stopping is knowing when to stop sometimes, but it has meant that there's been a really intergenerational relationship developed between myself and other people that I wouldn't have otherwise had the chance to meet from quite a wide geographical area but we're a community of interest because we all want to learn who our forefathers were. Um, so I just thought maybe now would be the time to break out into the breakout rooms and I see Shan with her finger up there waving at me. I'm just gonna say, um, so what I've done with the breakout rooms is I've taken all the different topics that people have said in the chat that they're interested in and I've made some different rooms under different themes. So we've obviously got people that are at various stages and Lots of people on this call are obviously very experienced and some people will be new. So perhaps we could do that first and then have those discussions in the rooms along the lines of what people were interested in. Great. So what, what will we do? You've got your you've so got the topics. Can I share my screen with you? I Please, know. I will stop sharing. So if I, I will share my screen. So this is Hopefully you can see that. So these are the groups or the themes that kind of came out of the chat that you were all kind of saying, these are the things I'm looking for and this is what I'm looking to gain out of the session. So we might not have all the answers, but there will be people on this call that have either been in that kind of space or at that stage with their projects or are obviously interested in those topics as well. So what I would suggest is that I've made rooms under those kind of themes and then I'm going to allow you to choose which room you want to go in. So you'll get an invite to choose which room you kind of think hits what you're looking for from this call. And then hopefully when you go into that room, there'll be other people all interested in the same thing. If you go into a room and nobody's there, have a little wait for a second and then come back and then we can put you in, a, in another room. Um, so I don't know exactly how this is all going to work with what people choose and what kind of some things might not seem very interesting to people and we'll get less people and there'll be because we've still got about 75 people on the call so if you're going to one room it's going to be very busy <laughs> um so let's just have a bit of an experiment and see what happens and it's it's going to open the rooms for 15 minutes you'll get the invite to choose um go in and come back if it really doesn't work and we'll sort of see okay <laughs> um so that sort of thing 
Yeah. And I've seen lots of examples around the UK of um, specific um, companies or charities or community interest companies, whatever it might be, social enterprises, um, running courses in facilities. Um, so I'm just trying to see if anybody has um, experience of uh, or knowledge of any sort of projects that we could look towards. Okay. So sort of as an example that you could copy then, you could run, that you could then run something similar? No, in terms of looking for partners who might want to run uh, some sort of either enterprise or um, service in the facilities that we've got. Whereabouts is it again, Heather, or Nicola? It's in Blackburn, Lancashire. Um, I did get a, um, a message, a direct message from Paul, is it Smalley? Yeah, that's Paul, he's um, on the call at the moment with you here. Yeah, um, so um, I think he had, he said that uh, Belfast Botanical Gardens had done something similar. Okay, was this for the Victorian Glass House? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, so I work in Northern Ireland and um, Belfast City Council um, and Belfast Museums. Um, so Belfast City Council owns the park botanic gardens that the, um, the glass house is in and the museum is attached and would have ownership of the build if you like. Um, now I think actually Eden Project was involved very, very minimally in the consultative basis at the early stages because of our own glass house experience and key and the work in Kew Gardens. But um, I know that I would have contacts with some of the people who did some of that glass house activity, because what we now have, if you want to look online, is it's called the Tropical Ravine. So wow. the end project. But one of the things that was hugely successful in the development of that project was the work that was done with the community around Belfast. So the, the social side of it. There was a huge investment in reaching out and finding out some of the history of the previous house and um, and people's memories of it as children, because, of course, it was, you know, there wasn't so much travel. So people visited the things that were on their doorstep much more like we are returning to at the moment. And um, and so what they did was have a social history project which involved poetry and art and the schools and older people's groups. It was very intergenerational with some key questions around memories. And so some of the young people went out and got some memories from their families. And then, of course, you know, there's a huge transition of movement of peoples and families. Um, you know, in Belfast, there's lots of people who maybe don't have family history who are establishing lives there now. And so what also was organised was for older people to come into some of the schools and share their memories, particularly in the area around that. And then um, some of the growing groups and different people were involved then in kind of the, the next stages and... Um, and some of that information was then put into a little booklet and as well as that, uh, and that was shared out. And, and then as well as that, um, you know, the boardings, when the work started to be, um, to, to take place, the development of the project, the hoardings that went up to allow the workmen to continue with an element of privacy and safety um, also then featured that work. So one of the things I, I suppose I'm saying to you is, is there's an opportunity for great connection just even before anything happens. Um, and sometimes that is easier to seek funding for in terms of making things, I suppose, making, um, making some noise. Yeah, um, we understand that. And we are doing that on lots of different levels. And that's why we're also um, setting up a small community garden that ties in with other local community gardens, um, the Incredible Edibles projects and also uh, food security in the food, food bank, the local food bank. Um, yeah. So we've got those connections. So the, the thing that I'm really missing is like the, the top down high level stuff of um, working out who might be a potential partner um, in terms of like an Eden project, then it's not the size of an Eden project, but then it's not as small as a community garden. Yeah. So um, there are examples of, say, the North Northwest local horticultural college has partnered with a, uh, a Victorian glass house restoration um, elsewhere in the region um, to deliver horticultural courses as a long-term partner. Um, obviously that's not something, we want to do something that's unique and that also gives benefit, a unique benefit to the local community that isn't necessarily being done 
elsewhere within the region. Got you. Have you thought, I mean, I, I presume you're working very closely with your local council as well? Yes, but not wanting to offend anyone that might be on the call that might be related to them, then they have other pressing issues, obviously, with the COVID crisis. Even before that, um, austerity measures were really pinching tight on them, and they didn't have the time or the resource to think creatively about how this might go forwards. Um, so we're sort of, as a supporters group, we're taking it upon ourselves to try to push um, some creativity in the process of how it might be a facility moving forwards. Yeah, and have you got creative minds involved, you know, people from different aspects of industry, whether that might be theatre, um, whether that might be, the, you know, strong community ties? Yes. You, yeah. You know, um, I mean, that, that would be the advice I would have given you was to make sure that you have the different styles of say, thinking involved. Yeah, locally, we're fine. It's the sort of the high level, big picture. If anyone had any examples, I know um, Gardener's World, a few sort of middle of last year, featured a couple of projects that were being run by um, uh, mental health um, uh, therapy providers. Um, like a social and, prescription type thing? Yeah. So social prescribing, but it was really sort of... Um, a private and professional delivery of service, if that makes sense to you, rather than being done on a sort of um, a small scale. Yeah, and so in terms of the question for all of us, what would be the question that you're asking? So I'm just I'm just seeing if you the other examples of so. I'm guessing that your sort of Belfast Museum example, is it the museum that's pushing the operation of the facility? Are they, well, are they, are they taking? So it's now, it, it was owned by there. So it, it, it's now developed, it's in action and it's open. But it, I, th I believe it was, there was a mixture of funding, but it was a heritage lottery fund that was supporting that. Is that right, Heather? Yeah, I think it's probably falls under the parks rather than the museum. Yeah, well, there was it's a mixture. operating facility though. Yeah both it operates between the two definitely did they because set up a partnership did they set up any kind of trust to to operate the facility or again i will have to after this call dig out some of the information because all i know is they approached me about doing the big lunch and then that was how we got involved and we used tropical ravine as a space to have one of our network meetings um but yeah i'll, I'll dig that out for you nicola because I, you know i wouldn't have that knowledge to hand um nicola Nicola, if you could see if you can contact a groundwork trust in your area. Um, yeah, we have a local groundwork trust. Yeah, I haven't yeah. contacted them though. Yeah, somebody there might have the local knowledge that could actually point you in the right direction. What you're asking is very specific, and it's probably well outside even my realms of knowledge, because the UK is quite different to how things operate here. So there are bigger organisations over there who do partner. Uh, more so and will be able to apply for big funding bids. Um, I suppose also if you looked at a different route would be what uh, partnering with a mental health charity and yeah. allowing them to make the provision and look at what's available locally. I think that's the thing that Gronje and I were hoping that people would take from this session rather than about growing things is literally about it's those growing the community and growing the connections and to think wider than what you normally do um we would, yeah, wouldn't have on with that definitely yeah. yeah yeah there's always more work we can do and there's almost yeah. al always more lessons that we can take from everybody yeah. else um well, yeah but, but for yourselves is if you think uniquely about to get something different so look at different organizations is there a good uh, employer in the area that we come in with a corporate partnership with you so that you're not looking for a bigger organization to come in and take over Whenever I'm hearing what you're saying, you're sort of looking for this big solution to it, whereas you're probably more geared up if you can get stay in control yourselves and you tie in to other local organisations, like keeping it on a level playing field. Uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm just looking at the successful projects, um, the precedents that I've got and the precedents that I've got is 
always where there is a, a strong uh, partner to operate the facility with. Um, yeah, well, I believe ground, a lot of the mainland groundwork trusts do more, uh, main, are like keeping places open and they sort of take over the running of uh, different establishments and gardens and parklands. In Northern Ireland here, because our structures are completely different, we are so much smaller. Um, we don't run on that basis. So that would probably be my advice is try one of them. Um, contact even uh, your lottery, so maybe your local uh, lottery funding uh, person, the coordinator there, they might be able to give you ideas of who is, else is active and give you suggestions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that's the idea is that think further than what you normally do because other people have the information. So Bronya doesn't, isn't really into community gardens, but she's here is saying, well, hold on Belfast Parks. They have a, a ravine up there and they partnered up with different ones. I, she doesn't know, but she's going to find that out for you. And I would say that's where your knowledge will come probably at a peer level rather than looking upwards. <laughs> Folks, just to let you all know, there was a few people just returning from the breakout rooms. So we've just continued the conversation that we were having in ours and finished that one up for you. Um, Shannon, have we got everybody back yet? I'm just kicking people out of rooms as we speak. <laughs> um, I'm very sorry if you longer. didn't go into the room that you wanted to but hopefully you did meet some people that were on a similar kind of interest to the questions that you did have even if you weren't in the group right. that just because tech is fun on zoom sometimes <laughs> <laughs> i mean when there are more people on a call it does take a little bit longer so we're all we're all patient don't you worry about that um so just waiting for a few more folk um okay that should be everybody back and not in rooms anymore um Okay, so Heather, we were going to um, just ask people to share a little bit of what they had come up with in the different rooms. Do you, um, do any of you want to just chip in and be brave? Come on, there's somebody. Uh, who's hello, playing. hello. Um, so just sort of summary of what we were talking about or just- so uh, Rebecca, Yeah, just tell us which room you were in and just, you know, a summary of some of the things that you were Okay, um, the, so we were talking about um, community engagement and um, one of the uh, participants in the group was saying about what they've been doing uh, with a community fridge, um, which sounds quite good. And they use a lot of uh, their allotment surplus for the community fridge, um, which seems like a really good idea. Uh, they also mentioned about a food forest, Food Connect, which I think is to do with community fridge and community orchards which I thought was all really if you've got the space that's fantastic I mean I'm, I'm in Surrey and space is a bit of a premium where we are it's all quite built upon but I like the idea of like using little spaces for a community orchard I think that's a really good idea um, I mentioned as well about projects I'm working on uh, with the local railway and um, we've adopted our railway station to pretty it up but also plant for wildlife um, and the idea being as well that maybe other railway stations down the line will do the same because seeds tend to blow on the wind. Exactly, planting for wildlife and um, we've got people of all ages, uh, beliefs, everything involved be because the main focus, the engagement aspect was that we focused on the railway. The railway is what we're all working towards. So that brought lots of people together that wouldn't normally, you know, be in contact, but who use public transport and have that interest. So sorry to waffle on, but anyway, no, that was really the gist. Helpful. Just what that you were was saying, the gist. It, it reminded me of um, a project that Groundwork did not so long ago in Belfast with York Gate Station, which was to make the um, the flower beds just outside the station and in the area of the station edible. So, you know, very simple that people could come off the train on their commute home or getting on the train on their commute home and grab the herbs that they might need for their dinner. Um, really yeah. simple things that, you know, connect your senses as well as, you know, the, the, um, the grow in itself. So, um, yeah, I mean, what, one, oh, sorry. No, okay. Well, sorry. I was only just going to, I was only just going to add that we are looking also at possibly uh, I went to Butts's farm with my children a little while ago, which is an ancient farm that they've reconstructed in Hampshire. 
and the idea being that they grow a lot of um, old herbs and stuff and then they use them for dyes and I was thinking we could do a bit of that as well and then like the local schools could use that space so again bringing children in um, they could use that space to pick some, you know learn about the learn about the dyes and maybe have a notice board telling the children what the herbs are because a lot of the old herbs and flowers they may not even know they exist so sorry that's it now no, no, that's a great <laughs> idea it's actually one of the simple ways to connect people you know just talking basically about that foraging aspect and learning because you know those skills of knowing what our plants were used for are being lost and it is one of the simple ways that you know people could take that idea from this call and make use of it whether that is to to you know print something and share it or whether it's to even just I mean laminate something that's not the best form of, for the environment but it means then that it's safe to put up somewhere and let people see when they're on their walk um you know what the birds are in that area or what the plants are in that area and just be mindful you know to keep an eye that that um doesn't get blown away and become litter itself but um you know there are there are ways and means to stay connected and it might just be through knowledge in our area at the moment, the beach, um, people are drawing little messages on stones and leaving them so that people find them when they're out on a walk, you know, just a, a, a little message of kindness. So there are things that we can do that don't need to cost much that can help us stay connected and keep people in a positive space, you know, kind of what we were aiming for in today's session as well. Does anybody else want to have a little go and say what you were talking about in your session? Have a go. Hi, James. Hiya. Uh, James Hunter here from Northern Ireland. Um, uh, I actually suggested um, things to think about during COVID restrictions about growing. Uh, and also, it turns out uh, that, uh, including myself, or some of us are like very isolated and uh, not really able you know, to uh, you know, go on a community thing, like physically meeting people. So trying to think of ideas of things you could do at home and still still say connected like literally growing over the internet if you like and uh, uh, one good suggestion was uh, instead of having your own uh, uh, using your own Facebook uh, identity you could you could have your own garden page for instance and that could be a thing for the future then if the garden it does take off uh, or whatever you're doing uh, people have something to relate to and uh, I was also saying that uh, I have a small yard and I have like, like small, you know, small like plastic greenhouses you get from B and Q and stuff like that there. So basically, I, uh, even now this time of year, I could start growing seedlings and stuff, and um, I could advertise then that I have that uh, that stuff for first. And I have no land or no land that's easily worked. But if somebody may have land, uh, they could just come and get that stuff and grow some stuff and maybe give me some later on. Um, uh, another suggestion was um, actually just growing stuff on the windowsill in the house uh, and even uh, there, was, there was a lady from Aberdeenshire where the weather is even more terrible there than it is here at, at the moment like she couldn't she's got a greenhouse but the, the greenhouse is only a few meters away from the house but you can't even get into it because of the snow and the ice and stuff so, so uh, and, and then there's a the problem of you know how do you get substrate to grow stuff in uh, uh, if you haven't got any soil or compost and you can't get it delivered um, um, so, uh, well, actually, what I did last year, I had anticipated this last year, so I've got a compost bin and I've been composting all my waste from the kitchen and stuff ever since. But another idea also would be um, like micro growing on your windowsill, which is soilless. And also, there's another great topic as well hydroponics, which is like growing stuff at home uh, soillessly, as well. You don't need soil at all. So, all like wee tips uh, just to keep in the, uh, you know, just to keep in the connection thing, uh, but without actually connecting it with anybody until it's safe to do so. Thanks for that, James. You mentioned micro growing without soil. Yeah. You know, like uh, spreading seeds in, uh, in jam jars and things. Ah, lovely, lovely. Yeah, it's very, very healthy as well. Yeah. It's fine. And Shan, you've got your, your hand up. Just there's, gonna, there's a few um, comments in the chat about people. Obviously, everybody on this call could potentially benefit from being connected. If you please don't share your emails in the chat, because that's obviously a very private um, communication method. We have had a few. What we'll do is we'll go. I'll go through the chat afterwards and take out personal contact details. But if you want to put in your organization name or your Facebook page links of anything you're kind of working with, or if you don't have time in the call, 
um, what we'll do is we'll compile them and send them out in a follow-up email. So we have all of your emails when you registered and we'll use them to send you stuff after this call. So we'll send you the recording and we'll send you anything that people have shared in the chat that's a useful kind of link up point. But if you just don't share your emails just because it's a bit more personal, we'd yeah. rather... And Keep folks, just to let you know as well, obviously we do have our network groups and our Facebook page, but we also have a community space called Our Community, O-U-R, I'm not very good at the pronunciation, of my, my accent says Our Community, <laughs> but Our Community, um, and it's designed that people can have these kinds of conversations. So if you want to join that space, all of you, to continue a conversation afterwards that's of mutual benefit, that's what it's designed for. So don't feel like you're going into that space and taking it over. I run that and I'm very happy to welcome you into that. And you can have a conversation on different themed areas. You know, we could we could start and put a picture up for a specific themed area and then you can converse and share ideas in that respect around that subject. Um, and that then means you have the safety of maintaining, as Shan says, you know, the privacy of your email. And it means then that new people could join and find that space and you could invite people into it as well, who may, be of, who may find it of use in the future. So you're kind of spreading the shared knowledge as well. Um, we do have a network space called Eden Project Communities, uh, and that's designed really for people who, who are at the stage where their idea is moving on to the next level. And Paul is one of our network developers for that space too. Um, can I can I just ask, was there anybody else that wanted to share what they talked about in their space? Just Gronya, in the absence of people, somebody else not coming forward there, can I just add in? I've been reading a lot of the chat and it's fantastic to see all the growing projects. Um, and seeing you know, just how people are connecting here from that. I suppose my learning today has been that in Northern Ireland here, we seem to already have quite a lot of little Facebook networks set up that we are accessing. Um, and that idea of allowing other people into it would be brilliant because we get so many ideas um, from our colleagues over in the UK there and the mainland, because um, we are quite a small area here and there's some fantastic projects. So I'm going to be busy over the weekend having a good look at a lot of these and getting some inspiration from them. So thanks for that, everyone. Nobody we will see me all weekend. Um, Heather, we were going to move on and talk about some of the ideas around growing, but actually James has covered some of that in terms of, you know, the individual yeah. ideas and um, things to start off with. And um, just going back to that, um, I think it would be useful for you to point out just some of the, the plants that were great starters for people who um, have never done growing at all, who you may be wanting to connect in in your area. And um, did you want to mention that just very briefly so that people who haven't got that knowledge will have it? So I'm going to start with my uh, my food interest of growing food. Um, and I've looked at some of the comments and people wanting to talk about the community fridges and supplying and food to other groups from that. And I would say the big thing is a sort of that expectation of what you can actually grow. Some of your sites, um, I'm looking and thinking you probably have a lot of land space. So you will, will be able to grow lots of things like potatoes and lots of carrots and onions and lots of traditional veg. If you don't have those big spaces, think of smaller, uh, quick growing crops. Baby spinach leaves, I mentioned those earlier, the oriental leaves. So that's your mixes that you get, your packed joys, your mustards. Uh, that sort of mix, uh, spring onions, or as we call them, scallions. All of those are quite quick growing. And if you're able to give those into food banks, so they can always be used to supplement what could be quite a bland diet. Um, so you'll have to do a bit of research though to check in your uh, local food banks to see if they will take any fresh produce. If not, use your networks to try and say these are available and make them available to people. Um, I suppose another one will be is the idea of foraging. You will all know your local areas and our countrysides are full of hedgerows with fruit, which doesn't get picked. So if you have knowledge of that, then you could be going out picking that again if you've got somewhere to pass it on to. Um, some simple flowers, you know, as I say, I'm a food grower all the way, but I acknowledge that we need to look after the pollinators as well. But people like to look at flowers and it gives them a lift. So, you know, if you're into quite technical and growing fancy ones, fine, I'm not knocking it. But your idea of your sunflowers, cornflowers, the calendula, nasturtiums, you know, all of those are really foolproof 
quite impactful and you can save the seeds off them and then you can share those with people again. So when you're getting others to grow those is actually talking to them about how they could save the seeds at the end of the growing season and have that for the following year. All right, Perry's asking about the fruit, the fruit, the birds. She's worried that you're going to have all of us leaving nothing for the birds. I, I think was one of the add, big tips just, around just, foraging is to make sure that you leave yeah. Yeah, your yeah. own fair share behind for the birds, particularly things like rose hips and things like that. Yeah. Well, Be conscious supposed- of the ecology that you're in as well. Like, so I've got an apple tree in my front garden and I was like, I could pick that and make three apple pies, but I left it and I've had birds all winter and that's, you know, they, they needed that more than me. So just being conscious of not just going into the countryside and picking if you don't need or you won't use because the ecology needs it too. So balance and just knowing where you are and everything. Yeah, and of oh. course there are some things which you pick. I think one of the one of the, the chat members has just mentioned that actually. And that, you know, some things benefit from you picking them. Heather, we mentioned this in the chat yesterday about how, um, you know, like, for instance, my chilli plant. I can't get over that I'm growing chilies in, in, in the glens of Antrim, but they're growing on my, on my kitchen windowsill and I'm doing nothing to deserve it. But I'm getting about a chilli every two weeks and just enough for like a little bit of spice in my dinner. And Heather was telling me that actually there's a reason why that's happening. Do you want to just fill that in? <laughs> um, well, I'm quite impressed if you're still getting chilies at this time of the year. It makes me realise your heat is a lot higher than mine is in the house <laughs> to go for that. But the plants are probably are trying to reproduce and they're reproducing from seed. So if you keep on taking their seeds away from them or their potential source of seeds, then they're going to keep on putting a burst of energy while they can to produce. Um, so that's the idea of... Um, a lot of the things that we're growing is actually probably understanding the life cycle of it and where we should be picking it. That's quite an interesting point, Gron, you'd have put me on towards it, is that in a lot of allotment sites, the amount of food that you see is wasted because people, they grow it and they stand back and admire it. And they're that proud of themselves, which rightly they should be, mm. but is picking it and using it you know, before it goes bad. It does have a life cycle. The farmers fill their, or do harvest it. There's somebody's got the head up. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can I speak? Yeah. I, yeah. The in the news like the last year or so, we've been hearing a lot of um, farmers saying that they're going to have their crops rotting in the fields because they can't get the Polish um, pickers and things. I don't know if that is the case. Is that something that could be looked into to sort of like um, is there already sort of thing liaise with farmers or? I, I didn't quite catch all of that. My internet was breaking up. Did you hear Heather? Yeah, I did. Um, so I vaguely remember from last year, they were looking at literally trying to get people to go out and be like a, a, a volunteer land picking army nearly for a, a seasonal times of the year. To my knowledge, it wasn't happening in Northern Ireland. So I don't have, I can't speak on that, but maybe there's, uh-huh. is there anyone else in the group here? Um, the call so to answer that? I know, I know, I'm, picking up now what was said Shan in Cornwall that happened didn't it that um, yeah, to just there was just there was just the need because of obviously lockdowns and people not being able to move around the country that there were local um local adverts just on on kind of work sites asking for that so if that's something that maybe is a need again this year li- linking up with people in your local area perhaps start with councils or start very locally to where you are, I suppose. Um, I was just gonna add, when I was in Brighton, um, there were groups going out doing gleaning after harvest. So things like pumpkins that weren't picked because they didn't quite fit you know, the supermarket standard. There were groups going and doing that kind of gleaning recovery. So there's definitely people looking at that kind of farm level um, food waste reducing. So there'll be things potentially um, at the commercial level to look into, um, but definitely there's gleaning afterwards. But you know, as folks, well. there's something to be remembered from that last year. You know, just because that was necessary last year doesn't mean it's not useful this year. It's mm. still a form of connection. It's still something that will be valuable for people to, you know, to benefit from. Rebecca, have you your hand up? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. And um, yeah, it was. It was just uh, the point before what to grow um sorry um that was really farming i just uh, well, i read something recently about people if people eat more seasonally seasonally then there's not as much need for the farmers to 
grow lots of other crops. But I guess that's a, I, I'm just, I'm sure there's probably some, some links to support that. I don't know. Um, any, um, the thing I was going to say was about um, in companion plants. So like roses, for example, you can plant lavender to them, can't you? And yeah. that one, ben one plant benefits the other. And the reason I, I, I mentioned that is um, a few years ago, um, my husband and I won a competition for our we didn't use anything on the garden. We used the insects. So we lace hotels, that sort of thing. And the lace wings kept the number of us down, um, which then made the plants grow better. And, like they had less to hold on them and that sort of thing. Um, so I would, also, I, I, from a personal level, um, suggest bringing in those aspects to encourage insects into your garden that can then self-regulate your vegetables and yeah. uh, and companion plants as well and folks sorry you know, i'm sure no that's really helpful and i'm sure there are some key workers amongst us you know um probably quite a few and just a quick point to mention as well that might be useful to some of you to also share in your own communities um, Grow Wild Kew Gardens are funded by the National Lottery Community Fund and they are at the moment offering free, free wildflower seeds which are native to your own regions across the UK to anybody who's a key worker and I see Ruth has her hand up. Yes that's very relevant. Um, sorry I'm suffering long Covid I'll, I can't remember. Don't worry, don't you worry at all. If you think about it, just, you know, stick, we have, we have again, you know, because we're coming towards the end of the call, really, aren't we, Heather? But you had yeah. mentioned to me about the marigolds, Heather, and, you know, it was something that I hadn't even thought about, um, how much joy I'd had with growing marigolds with the children when they were in nursery, and how much joy that could bring to people now as well, you know, in the next, in the next um, stages of spring and onwards. Yeah. There was one in the chat that I noticed there was uh, Kelly O'Brien had said about we'd all lost the art of preserving. I would put that as to probably quite a lot of people have lost the art of cooking from scratch. And I would urge everyone in their growing projects to try and bring in some cooking element to it um, and keep it simple. You know, and be aware that sometimes you will come across people who, who aren't eating a lot of vegetables who haven't been trying that, and it's not a judgment call, it's just how our diet seemed to have changed. Um, what you will have to do is make sure, keep in touch with your local environmental health and make sure you are following all the hygiene regulations. Quite often here, I know they probably, they have an aversion to cooking in community gardens, then composting and cooking doesn't go together. Uh, so just keep yourselves right in that. But yeah, it's definitely skills that we need to all go back to. And Ruth, you've remembered. Thank you. Um, one thing that I've come across time and time again, and it's critical to our push for all these wonderful projects that we're involved in and thinking of getting involved in, thinking of creating. If we don't work with the, with the authorities um, when we're talking about their use of pesticides, bringing um, landscape companies in and so on, they can easily undo community efforts. Everything we do has to be done and coordinated with the professionals, the councils, roadsides and verges, maintenance. Um, one of the terrible things that keeps happening is they're still using pesticides and so on. And I am so against that. And to encourage, I love foraging and I encourage people to identify plants and forage and whatever, and yes, grow their own edibles in public places. One thing that really worries me though, is that people will eat things that are polluted. We have to work with the authorities. We can't work in isolation. It's true, Heather. Did you want to come back on that? I think it's then have a think of what you can do as an individual. You know, so you have maybe can you have that look that conversation with someone in your local council? Can you even persuade them to leave one verge as a trial? 
um, a lot of the councils are now moving towards this no mow and they are allowing areas to be rewilded. And I hate to say why there's benefits for the environment out of it, it's more uh, the benefit to their pockets that they're thinking about. <laughs> That's the reason why they're not. Um, so yeah, right, no you still have a conversation. Yeah. That don't that don't mow approach has certainly been the case yeah. in my council area, and it you know there there's the balance of um you know keeping the road safe of course you know being able to see where you're going, around corners and whatnot, but um that is also looked after by local custodians. So what we have is people in those areas who make contact and let people know when maybe it's getting a little bit out of control, um but it has led to there being an opportunity to bring and collect those seeds um. And it has led to a lot more wildlife, wildflower activity, even, you know, up the motorways where we are at the moment, the motorway into Belfast, there's some beautiful flowers on it on the way up from Balamina to Belfast. And, and that's thanks to that activity. So it's quite right, Ruth. And that only starts when people put up their hand and say, can we try this, you know? Yeah, the Eden Project, Eden Project themselves have uh, the National Wildflower Centre um, within Eden, and they've been working with Cornwall Council um, so they're putting verges along, wildflower verges along some of the A roads, and it's a bit of an experiment, but it's it's growing in traction. There's there is a movement towards this rewilding, but also just other ways of regenerating or putting, just not destroying habitats and seeing what Hopefully we when can it's leave. safe again. We'll be yeah. we'll be driving down that motorway, sitting behind a hundred caravans, and we'll be able to enjoy the beauty of the wildlife and the wildflowers that are sitting. That is just out the I'm looking forward to when <laughs> that caravans will come back again. There was one day where there were just so many caravans coming to Cornwall when lockdown was eased the first time around. It was insane. <laughs> uh, but yeah. But this is the point of this, you know, this growing, I mean, growing community, that's what we were talking about. That's what we're talking about, about being connected. And, you know, one of the, the small joys, you know, and we have to hold on to any joys we can have. But some of the joys has been the time that adults have been able to spend with young people. I can see Carrie there with one of her little ones in, on the call. And, um, you know, like make the most of that. Some of the stuff we've been talking about now, most of you will nod your head and go, yep, know that. Yep, know that. But just think about who doesn't know that where you are and how you might share that. It might be as simple as instead of posting something negative on Facebook about how many COVID deaths there have been or many and um, people who are, not, who are not wearing their gloves it might be that you share a positive that counteracts some of that ne negativity that other people share and it might be that you simply post hey did you know that key workers can get wildflowers here's how you get them it might be that you post oh i didn't realize today that if i grew lavender beside roses it will do x y or z you know there are little things that you can do and to use the power of social media and just or even just your own voice um, to spread a positive message and pass information on. And what we'll be doing now with this chat is there's so much information there, folks, um, is we'll be going through that and looking to see what might be the follow on from this call, what might be the topic that we use as our next, you know, bringing together to discuss and, 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 and consider ideas and share them. But please, if you do nothing else out of today's call, just do one thing to share some information that you might know or have learned today on to somebody else in your area in a positive way. Um, and do think about who's coming behind you and the fact that people don't know everything and they are all interested to know what you know. Um, and we hope it was useful. We hope you felt connected today. Um, and yeah, please do check out the Our Community Facebook group because this is a conversation that could really flourish and grow. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, thank you so much to Heather. Please uh, join me in thanking Heather because this was her first attempt at doing one of these and we were so nervous when we saw the numbers, but you've been an absolute superstar, Heather. Thank you. Thank you.